This is Brooklyn's All Right If You Like Saxophones, a public access enlightenment showcasing the atoms that make up the wonderful structure that is our reality. Esoteric artists, tuneful conjurers, wise scribes, and record label tastemakers get a few basic questions to let them bring you in on the who, what, how, when, but you know where, because Brooklyn's All Right. Welcome to Brooklyn's All Right. I have with me Ev Gold of Cinema Cinema, and we're going to be talking to him about his project. How you doing, Ev? I'm doing well, Adele. Good, good. Uh, so, how did you first get involved in music? Okay. Um, 1987, I was nine years old. Uh, I hadn't really gotten uh, bit by the music bug or gotten really motivated by music previous to then. There was music around my house, a lot of Grateful Dead and Neil Young, which I can appreciate. Um, but nothing had kind of like, you know, staggered me or sparked me until uh, I heard uh, Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as uh, you know, I mean, in keeping this honest and true, we might as well keep it honest and true. It wouldn't be genuine if not. Uh, you know, I'd love to say it was something else uh, all these years later, but it definitely was uh, hearing that song, Welcome to the Jungle, and then getting that album out, Path of Destruction. And, loving how it made me feel like it was kind of this off the rails defiant didn't know what the singer sounded like it was really kind of unique in my first real exposure that i started to collect uh, like magazines whatever i could find about them and, and there like my quest was born because like i heard them mention like the sex pistols or i heard them mention the stones so then this is 1987, this predates the internet by far. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I just Googled and wikied them and followed a link. It was like, oh, so now never mind the bollocks, I should see what that is. And then I was down the rabbit hole. And then I felt like I wanted, I want, that feeling that that band gave me, that, is, that escape from the moment, that medicinal, magical lift, I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to be a part of that. So hearing Guns N' Roses when I was nine years old definitely is what made me want to get involved in music, to so, be totally honest. Around what time did you pick up a guitar? I picked up a guitar by 1992. I tried, I, I, I immediately, I had a guitar. You know, I, I hate to tell on myself, but you, you caught me in the, in the corner now. Now I'm in the corner of truth and there's only light in the room. Um, I, 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 of course, started to hound and harass my, my family for a guitar as soon as possible. I felt I had. I did it too. I, I, I felt I had in me to be a singer, but I didn't have anyone else around, so I wanted to have a guitar. I wanted right. to create. Uh, I had a guitar by 1989, um, which within you know I was about 11 at the time. I as soon as I got it, I, it was an acoustic, and you know, and I, and I looked at it, and I was like, "Wow, this doesn't look as easy, you know? Like there's all these strings and these lines and the frets, you know? And it was just." It really seemed kind of complex, and it hurt my fingers. And I wrote this song where I just would strum, 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 so strum, strum, and like have a little melody over it. And I was like, "That's not a song. I don't know what this is." And doing art in your own way is essential. But it, it, I didn't think I was gonna be able to climb the the, the guitar playing uh, tree. So did you wind up taking classes, or I, a, another nice little breadcrumb you threw down for me? It's funny. Um, my parents were really young. They were 16 and 20 when they had me. So my dad was 16 and my mom was 20. So uh, in the tumult of the late 70s that I was born in and not too planned for, by the time I was five or six or seven, before I heard Guns N' Roses, my dad was out of my life and doing his own thing. My mom was involved in her life and I was just this little guy. Um, my dad wound up coming back into my life uh, about a year after I got the guitar. And the guitar had been sitting there and I hadn't pursued getting lessons for it. I was kind of, you know, I, I didn't have, I didn't grow up with brothers and sisters. I had a bunch of half-brothers and sisters later on in life. So I was kind of an only child. I kind of was really into my imagination and stuff. And the thought of, like, the submissive nature of taking lessons from another, like, I didn't really have a father you figure did. around. I just felt intimidated and weird. Right. I didn't even want to ask for lessons. It just sat there, and I, by osmosis, thought I'd learn. Mm -hmm. So, uh... It, it became dusty and like, you know, eventually a string popped off and it was just sitting there as, you know, it's like a flip book as the time went on, just mm -hmm. sitting in the corner. And me the whole the while writing down these great ideas of when I'm going to be in a band one day and song titles and all these things that I can't flesh out. Um, and then my father uh, came back into my life um, 
in, in just a, a very random way. Uh, but it was a, he came back to my life to kind of pretty much stay at that point from then forward, and that was in 92. And he's an artist, a visual artist, uh, graduated from SVA, did advertising, has done all that stuff. But a uh, guitar player, like he, he definitely, he regards himself more as a musician, but he, he's made his life as an artist, as, you know, paid doing his drawing, which is, you know, I mean, God bless Baruch Hashem, however you want to say it, you know, I mean, good for him. Mm. But he's always, in his mind, he's a guitar player. He's a really right. bitching guitar player. He taught me. So I got lessons straight from my dad, and it was the kind of... Um, it was a really natural way. I, I don't know what prompted him to do it, but he kind of got me rolling by teaching me songs at first, rather right. than just uh, just the notes of the strings. So like learning Knocking on Heaven's Door by Bob Dylan, which was just G, D, and C, which G, D, and C is the three chords of so many songs. Mm -hmm. But getting that kind of strum this chord twice, this twice, the last one four times, sing over it here, fought the whole ritual for lack so he, of a better he, term. He made you not just, or he helped you not just become a guitar player, but a singer the, with the, the guitar. The package yeah. of it, the package of it. Finding really kind of like, um, you know, you get this, like it's almost like an inter internal kind of clock that you tune your music to, you know, like, and I kind of had a bit of a voice, I had a bit of ambition to, to do singing, I felt I could emote that way. And with the guitar as, as well, as soon as I picked it up, it felt kind of natural once he started to show me. So. He kind of led me to to where I, I would later become uh, what I am now, a, a guitar player and singer in a band. I learned how to play initially with the idea I wanted to get really good at playing rhythm and be mostly like a singer in a punk band who could bring ideas right. or be one of the dudes, you know, singing and playing rhythm, not like a, you know, a virtuistic riff meister, right. crazy sound effect. I think part of the you reason... You didn't see yourself as a lead guy. Never. <laughs> never, never, never. When I first learned, I mean, the biggest, the, the biggest thing that my, my dad told me, and if, if this part makes the final cut and doesn't get ended, hopefully a new guitar player out there will hear it, but why well, I'm a right-handed, but my right hand is, is more important than my left. You know, like that feel, that rhythmic approach, that movement, the attack, it's not the, the notes, it's not the speed of the, or the, even the placement, it's really has a lot of right hand, a lot of guitar players kind of, I think forget that or left hand. They forget the strumming has so much to do. You know, it's it's the wrist in, in the paint brush, you know, kind of that um, players when they're young they just want to get good and get better than the next guy and be bitching and you kind of can forget certain things. So he told me that early on and it stuck with me. And that made me feel real comfortable with like the approach of rhythmic rhythm guitar, um, putting songs together and right. that was my thing. I mean I went on to just be a singer in, a, in a, the next two bands I was in from 1994 moving forward. Uh, I started playing gigs, um, started getting out. I was 15 uh, when I played Lemoore's, which was a club in Brooklyn back mm -hmm. then, the first time. I was 16 the first time I played the Pyramid Club and CBGB's. Um, you know, so I mean, the guitar just stayed. It was like my, almost like my, uh, it was like a, it, my, it was, it's like, it's hard, to, it's hard to say, not, not an educational tool, but um, I, I, I didn't strive to, uh, like, like we said earlier, I didn't strive to, to, to do the virtuistic right. stuff. It was kind of like I needed that as a bedrock to further uh, enhance my songwriting that I was starting to develop because I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, bring my slant to the table, my view, my voice. So, so tell us how and why you started Cinema Cinema. Okay. Um, in 2008, uh, that was when Cinema Cinema started. Uh, as Paul, my cousin Paul Clower, and myself, uh, January 11, 2008, was our first practice. Um, more or less, I had done bands since, as I mentioned earlier, since uh, the early 90s, um, and always, always respecting and 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 regarding bands that had intense work ethics and and who toured and went for it as like you know who to look up to. Always uh, really loving the whole black flag element and nature of the ethics that they brought to it, um, you know, the SST on, on, on that coast and Discord on, on this coast, like what they meant and the whole do-it-yourself kind of ethic. Um, I never got a chance to hook up with the right guys to do that. You know, I mean, I kind of feel like you get this notion when you're young, like if all the planets align, I'll, I'll get in a band that'll get really known and famous. And it's just like the planets must align for you to find other guys just to get in a band mm -hmm. and agree on songs yeah. and then do shows and make it a priority. Right. Anything past that it is good. 
you know, and you should appreciate it. It's real. It counts now. It's not, we're not on the way to something that counts. It counts now, you know. So um, I spent from the time I was 15 to the time I was 30, 15 years uh, playing in bands that, I mean, some of them were good, some of them weren't good, right. some of them were this, some of them were that, some of my screen had a shaved head, some of them I was trying to sing nice stuff, you know, all, all that stuff. In California for two years even doing it. Um, it was, you know, I mean, I'm an artist. It was, you know, you, you kind of tumble end over end, you know, chasing yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't know what makes you do the art. It's just that you're alive, right. so you do it. You know, I mean, I know, I know you know that for sure. I know that you, you're very, you're like a renaissance man in your own, you know, in your own dark way. You know, but I, you're involved in a lot of things. We don't know why. We just must. Exactly. You know, so... Um, I never, uh, in that 15 years, hooked up with a band scenario where it was really expressing just what I wanted to express, I think. It was always kind of like what I thought I should be expressing. Really? Um, and also, never did one that went beyond the do a show once a month at home, pack it out, everyone's here, it was a big rock night, you know, like, and I'm not taking that away from, you know, a hometown hero kind of people or people who, who my, you know, like that wasn't... I, I had a lot of fun doing that for a long time, but it was never as serious as what I really, really wanted. Uh, I had also gotten married in my early 20s, and it was the wrong relationship. Um, and it was kind of stifling me from moving in the direction of doing a band as serious as I wanted to as well. So as my 20s drew to a close, uh, and that, um, the marriage dissolved. Uh, and that uh, divorce, that ultimately came right at the time when... I had seen Paul, my cousin, playing in his previous band to, uh, to what, we, what we do now. And I couldn't believe what I saw. He was just a maniac. He was just filling up so much room and he was just really carving such intricate, beautiful stuff in, in the band that he was playing with at the time, which was a totally different type of band than cinema. Okay. I could just tell, you know, when you just tell a good drummer, mm -hmm. that raw talent, it speaks to you. And it's like, it doesn't matter if you like the band that he's playing in or not. He had that energy and I thought that's... Uh, that's my drummer right there. I mean, he's my cousin, <laughs> you know, like I don't mean to steal him from these guys, but I'm getting divorced right now and I want to start a band right. that's going to just get in the fucking van and go, you know. Um, and there's 10 years difference between us. I'm born in 78, he's born in 88. So I was 29, he was 19 at the time, and he was still uh, finishing college. So he had a lot of free time and it's, he has an energy level kind of like me, although he's, he's a lot calmer. Right. But um, <laughs> he was like, Ready to go. Ready to go. Awesome. You know, and that's how out of the gate um, we started, and we started working really hard right off the bat. We, our first practice was January 11th, 08, and by September of 08, we started touring uh, with our first our first run going to Cincinnati. How'd you come up with the name? The name. Um, it's it's directly. It's actually from a film, uh, 1993 film called Man Bites Dog. Um, it's like a mock documentary, uh, a satirical uh, take, almost in the Spinal Tap nature, but they're not following a failing band. They, they, this film crew's following a serial killer on his exploits as he supports himself murdering people and taking their money in comical ways and horrifying ways and just all the right ways. It's, you know, it's, it's done well. Um, so as, uh, you know, in 1993, when I saw that, that summer I was 15, I was really, like, a, you get, like, thirsty for knowledge, you know, like, um, it, and it was the time, I had just discovered a lot of punk rock and a lot of things that would later form, you know, what I do now and, and ideals that I, I take serious, and um, I saw that movie that summer, and this one scene stuck with me, uh, as he descends into man, you know, three quarters of the way through, every movie has an end, you know, the play, you know, the tape has to end in real life and movies, the whole nine, so, He's a serial killer, it's going to have to find its way to, you know, not so much resolve, but end. So he starts to descend into madness about three quarters of the way through. Um, and he takes them out, one of his last big scores, he takes them out to uh, his, you know, dinner and drinks the whole nine, and they get out of hand. And it's like his neighborhood watering hole, and then he gets thrown out. So it's like, you know, the descent is on its way. So as he gets thrown out, um, they're all drunk, and he leads them in this improvised um, chant of cinema, cinema. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's basically cinema, cinema, and then it's in French, but like it's 
you know, from town to town, from port to port, da -na 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 cinema, cinema, you know, and it's, and then he has them all in the moment just chanting cinema, cinema. When I was 15, I was just like, I think that would be a cool name of a band. I don't know. I'm going to file that one away. It's stuck. Yeah, it's stuck, you know, and like, and I had it sitting there for a long time and didn't find the right scenario. Uh, and then I was like, you know, this... I'm approaching my 30s, I don't know what that means, but I'm getting out of this relationship. I, I want to devote myself to my art, I want to do this, I don't care what I have to do, yada yada. This is cinema cinema time. Well, let's go with that. And um, that's where the, it comes from. I definitely highly recommend the movie, it's entertaining, uh, it, it's, it's a good watch for sure. I do too. So tell us, what's in the future for Ev Gold and Cinema Cinema? Going to be a lot more of what we're doing now. Uh, for both me, myself, and I have gold and Cinema Cinema, which is kind of like my, my life blood, my, my main project. A lot more hard work. We have a lot of good stuff coming up. Um, this summer, we're going to be opening for Black Flag, uh, which we're really excited about, which, I mean, I, I can't even try to act aloof, like, we're opening for Black Flag, so what are you doing this summer? You know, like, it's jump up and down, wow, great, thrillingly amazing honor that we're so psyched to be doing so. Um, that came about uh, at a relationship that grew with us and Greg Ginn from all of the touring that we've done over the last few years. Uh, back in 09 when we did tons and tons of shows, we had through this one circle, through another circle, we, we came together and we met him and we really hit it off and the idea of touring with him when we could uh, was put on the table. And since then, we've done I think about five different runs with Greg with different solo bands that he's had over the last few years which is how this naturally came to be. He never mentioned Black Flag doing shows. We never mentioned it to him because he lives in the now and so mm -hmm. do we. You know, so we kept it all very, very cool. And when he said to me this past January, we're going to do some Black Flag stuff, I was just, I just as a fan thought that's great. Well, you know, I mean, so when it turned into we were going to be able to do some shows with them, that's an honor. We're really excited. Um, we're also right uh, around that time putting out uh, a vinyl. Um, in Dromedary Records, a New Jersey-based label. Uh, they asked us to be a part of a, a compilation that this year, 2013, that their 20th anniversary being a label, which very much stoked us being a small mom and pop label that has you know, stayed through it all and worked hard um, because we're so DIY, working with labels, something that really didn't appeal to us in any way. Uh, but Al and Dromedary, um, they're really good, good peeps who just care about spreading music. So uh, we did a show in Maxwell's last year. They saw us. They asked us to be on this compilation celebrating the year 93, their starting year, 20 years ago. So uh, they're having bands do a song from 93, and we chose to do 50 Foot Queenie by PJ Harvey. And when we did it and we sent it to Al and Drama there to check it out, they were pleased with it, and it is really pretty maniacal. Um, so that's going to be put out as a 7-inch 45 the week that we play with Black Flag. So uh, we'll have those available, and we're excited about that to, uh, to have something that we did in vinyl. The B-side will be a song from our release from last summer from Mad Children and Soul Aggression. Uh, and then this fall, we'll be going to Europe, uh, which will be a tour that we do with Martin B.C. Um, he's a producer who's been around for a little while. If you don't know the name, he's worked with Swans and Sonic Youth, uh, Helmet, a bunch of other bands. Uh, we came across him uh, in the Gowanus, where his studio is, where we had our practice space. Our practice space was washed away in the hurricane um, that hit the East Coast last October of 2012. Um, the day that we went to go get our gear out of the space that had been flooded down in the, the Gowanus Canal area of Brooklyn, um, as we were dragging it out, I noticed Martin. He's been in that area for the last 30 years. He was out taking a jog, kind of looking around his neighborhood to see the destruction. It was really a crazy time in Brooklyn at the time. Um, I lived in Brooklyn almost, I'm born and raised here, uh, aside from about two years in California, I lived through all my life, and it was pretty upside down the way things got um, with the hurricane last, uh, last fall. Uh, it was pretty nuts in some areas. Other areas were badly affected, but um, nonetheless, he was out casing his neighborhood, and we bumped into him as we had all our destroyed, strewn gear about us, glowing, toxic sludge, horror, uh, and we struck up conversation, and it was based around how we love playing music, and no matter what, we're going to play more, let's play together. Um, it wasn't some big pitch like, you produce Swan, so let's record. It was just like, oh, you're a friendly face. We're all kind of up shit creek here. 
You know, when we get things together, we'll remember we saw you this day and we'll play together. And it came to be. In the first week of January, we did a benefit show um, at the Grand Victory in Brooklyn, and Martin was on the bill. It was a benefit for hurricane relief, but the organizers set it up so that we would solely benefit. It was a benefit show for us. Scenic Presents, Robert Johnson, um, they do amazing stuff here in Brooklyn. They're the people who are handling our, Brooklyn, our Black Flag show. Uh, they book a lot of the stuff that we do, and they uh, came through for us. Sean Doherty, who, who helps run Grand Victory, they said, guys, just put a bill together. You guys lost all your gear. Put a bill together, and we'll do everything we can to give you the whole door. So the bands all agreed, and we had Martin on it. And it was one of those, shockingly, everything went well nights. Everything went right nights, like a, something for the movie script or something. Like, it was packed. It went well. We made enough that we could bu replace gear, and, and ultimately Martin had a, a booking agent of his um, at that show. She was just there to check him out. You know, she didn't know us. And then we did our thing, and she was really happy with our thing, and, and it made her excited. And that, from that, grew this plan, and now it's starting to have confirmed dates of this European tour this November with us and Martin. Martin is going to headline, and we're going to actually act as his band on a couple of dates, um, backing him, and we're going to open the whole thing. And it's going to go all around Europe. It's going to go to Berlin, Prague, um, Slovakia, Den Haag, I mean, Austria, Vienna. These are the, the stuff that's been thrown around. I know Wednesday, November 6th, I think, is, is in Prague for sure. And the 7th might be in Austria. And the Friday, the 8th might be Slovakia. I know there's one. We're trying to go off the beaten path. We're trying to go where people really want want to get their faces fucked up. Right. You know, we, we really want to, you know, we want to go to the core, go to the, where, you know, it doesn't, you know, where it doesn't get to that often. We want to try to lay down a trail so we can start going there regularly. Cool. Um, well, you guys deserve it, because uh, I'm, I'm glad the hurricane didn't do much, because uh, I, I love you guys, and I want to keep uh, keep checking you guys out. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ev Gold of Cinema Cinema for coming on. Let's check out some of Cinema Cinema.
Thanks for watching. Hope to see you out on the streets of Brooklyn.